Today's conversation is sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. If you're an accredited investor and you want to find out more about investment opportunities, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest. I made a decision that I wasn't going to depend on any government, any company, any anything other than me to, to manage my finances, manage my wealth, and make sure that I, I made my dreams come true. You're listening to the Going Long Podcast with Billy Keels, the number one podcast for long distance real asset investing. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. And yes, I am your host, Billy Keels. And today we have something very, very new and exciting for you, especially when you're ready to take your game to the next level. Today's conversation, you're going to love it really quickly. So many of you continue to leave your honest written reviews as well as ratings, and we continue to move up the charts together. So thank you very much. If you have not had a chance to do that, go ahead and leave your uh, honest written review as well as a rating. Lots of you are continuing to do it. It's really, really awesome. You're giving us feedback. We're going to be changing some things based on your feedback. It's awesome because you're going to get more of what you want. Uh, Also, too, if you want to check out previous episodes, because we've done over like 208 or something like that at this point, probably well over that. Just go to billykeels.com. When you get there, go to, it'll change a second, but then you will see a tab that says podcast. Click the podcast tab. You can check out every single episode. You can binge. It'll be awesome. Uh, It will be absolutely fantastic. So listen, today's conversation is going to be really, really awesome. Uh, We've got a guy who was disconnected himself from the matrix. He's gotten out there. He's investing from North America, from Canada to the U.S., helping other people do it. It's going to be really, really awesome. We're going to get to the conversation with Brian Bogart. We're going to get to that just after this. Are you a busy, high-paid professional, someone who's made $200,000 the previous two years and also expected to earn $200,000 this year? Or maybe as a couple, you filed jointly and you've earned $300,000 the previous two years and also expected to earn $300,000 together this year. Or maybe yourself or as a couple, you have a million dollars in net worth, not including your home. Well, if you meet any of those criteria, then the IRS considers you to be someone who is an accredited investor. And so that probably means you're a top producing software sales executive, or maybe you're a highly paid consultant. Maybe you're a lawyer, maybe you're a doctor or or a business owner. You may even work for a professional sports franchise. Well, one way or the other, you've done a lot of really hard work to get to where you are. You've done 100% of the work, and nowadays you're continuing to get crushed by taxes. And that means you're only bringing home 50% of the reward. If you're tired of doing this over and over, and you're looking for a solution to start to keep more of your money, you can go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest so that you can start to keep more of your money, which means that you can start to have the freedom to choose what you want to do, when you want to do it, with whom you want to do it. So once again, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest to see how we can start to help you today. Once again, that's firstgencp.com forward slash invest. So if you want to understand how coaching can take your long distance investing success to the next level, then guess what? (laughs) Today's the conversation you're going to want to listen to until the very last word. I promise today. You know why? Because listen, today's guest not only started his professional career in in corporate instruction, and I think he's going to tell us what that means exactly. And it sounds like he's been doing that. Uh, It's probably a sweet spot for him. He's also realized that uh, the corporate game was not the one for him. So he decided to co-found his own investment company, which I think is pretty darn cool. He's also focused today on bringing investors together for very specific investments that it was who he was doing before and he continues to do. And then today he continues to work with realtors as well as high wage earners as a financial and wealth coach at Next Level Success Coaching. Gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Brian Bogart. Brian, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Billy, it is a pleasure and honor to be here. I'm super excited for this conversation. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. I know that you're gonna add so much value and well, I don't wanna tell all the reasons why because I wanna let you do that. Uh, But let's get into the conversation because as you know, Brian, I like to ask everybody at least the same five questions. You're gonna get two in the beginning. You're gonna get three in the end. In the middle, you're probably gonna get a lot more questions. I just don't know what those questions are. So if it's okay with you, we'll go ahead and get started in helping us to understand where is it that you live in North America? So currently, I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, which is uh, right above New York State for those from the U.S. who don't have an atlas lying around. But I'm actually just about to move right across the country. Uh, I'm originally from out west, and I'm heading back there to Calgary, Alberta, 
which is right above Montana. And the short story around that is real estate prices in Toronto have gone nuts. So what do the investors do? Buy low, sell high, right? I am selling my, you know, nice house, nice yard here in Toronto for a crazy figure and moving out to my two acre uh, dream house in Calgary, Alberta with a view of the mountains. Wow, that sounds very, very fantastic. So from east to west, absolutely fantastic. And you know what? The other thing, Brian, we really love positivity here. And so could you do us a favor? Could you share what the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours is? Well, Billy, I, as I said, I'm getting ready to move. And I was actually in Calgary last week doing inspections and all that sort of stuff. And, and I got home on the weekend, you know, and you know what traveling can be like, especially in, in what's been happening lately, right? So yep. everything went fine, but it was a little bit stressful. And what's happened really in the last 24 hours is, you know, my friends are aware that I'm, I'm moving, that I'm leaving Ontario. So everybody's reaching out like, hey, do you need help moving? Hey, can we get together for breakfast this week? Hey, do you need anything? And I, I mean... As much as I, I love investing, it's so that I can have the time to do the things that I love, which is really connecting with people and building relationships and chatting and having conversations like this and, and educating and empowering people. So it's just been such an amazing reminder to me that, you know, ROI doesn't just come from investments. It also comes from relationships. Absolutely. ROI comes from relationships. And I am such a big fan in the entire Going Long family, like w the yeah, having the freedom to do what you want to do when you want to do with whom you want to do is like paramount. So absolutely love you sharing that. Really appreciate it. And we know you've got lots going on and, and you've got a very, very promising future, one that you're constructing and designing, which is another thing that does music to my heart as well. But here, like, I, I want to just, I've got to tell you something, Brian. Yeah, the entire, the entire Listen, the entire Going Along family, like they know about this because I'm a guy who like, I got to, I keep a pretty high standard. And the thing is, I even give myself this really impossible task. And that's trying to tell the guest, and today you're my special guest, our special guest, try to tell your backstory in like two and a half seconds. <laughs> it's like so wrong, right? It's impossible. It's impossible. But I try every single time I try, I try. But the reality is, is nobody's going to tell your backstory better than you. So I would love for you to share your backstory in your own words. And the other thing that I would love for you to help me out with personally please, is if you can share some of the major decision points that you've made, because I know that's going to add a lot of value to the entire Going Long family to help us understand how you got to this point in your journey. And then we'll see kind of what questions we come up with from there. Does that, does that seem fair? Perfect. Perfect. Right, perfect. So over to you. I mean, to sum up my backstory in two and a half seconds, it would be <laughs> I, I've lived the Matrix, the movie, the Matrix. OK, now to draw it out a little bit longer, what I mean by that is I started out like Mr. Anderson. I had a good life. Right? I was I was working in the IT sector and, and, you know, I had a good life. I had a good salary. I had an upscale condo that I was living in. I went on vacations every year. But there was just something in the back of my mind, just like the character Mr. Anderson in the movie. There was something in the back of my mind that just this wasn't what I was meant to be doing. This, this wasn't satisfying. I felt like there was more. There was additional levels in life that just didn't seem possible by doing the, the, the corporate route. So like Mr. Anderson, I started searching. I started searching because I believed that there was alternatives out there. And long story short, the guy I was sitting beside at work was investing in real estate. And so he became my, my first sort of Morpheus, if you will, right? And now I started to become Neo in learning how to invest. And then I had just read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So, you know, I said, Rich Dad says we should start a company and start doing this with all kinds of people. And he's like, great, you want to deal with the people, I'll deal with the properties. He was a bit of an introvert. So we literally started our own corporation uh, back in 2004. And we started investing with other people. And we started moving in and out of the matrix, just like in the movies, and using it to our advantage. Eventually, four years later, we both retired from the, uh, the corporate world in our 30s. And, and then I eventually moved out here to uh, Toronto to, to pursue things further, to get you know, further into investments. And after what I saw in the crash of 2008 and 2009, and this was one of those decision points, I looked at that and I said, okay, so because of a lot of misuse of finances, we just saw like 90% like of the, the Western world lose their retirement, lose all that money. But then there was this smaller group of people, tiny group of people 
that not only were they perfectly fine going through this crash, but they actually added to their wealth and added to their net worth through it. And I'm not talking about the ones that took advantage of other people. I'm talking about the ones that just knew what was happening and knew what to do to preserve their wealth and even be able to build on it. And, and, you know, Warren Buffett called in, I think he said it in 2009 or 2010, this is the buying opportunity of a lifetime because the stock market and the real estate markets were so low. So I started dedicating myself to learning about what was it that this tiny group of people were doing differently than what everybody else was, uh, was doing and then applying it. And then, you know, did that, invested in a bunch of different things, learned some lessons, got my butt kicked a couple of times, but, you know, learned along the way. And then about eight years ago, people were like, Ryan, why aren't you teaching people how to do this, how to actually become financially free, how to retire in your 30s or 40s rather than your 60s or 70s, how to manage investments and and your finances. And I was like, yeah, you know what, you're right. My investment style, I, I'm not a day trader. I'm not doing stuff every hour on the hour. So I've got lots of free time. So I opened up my coaching business. And, and you know, it's about educating and empowering other people on what I've learned along the way. I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly about uh, investing. And that could be investing in real estate. That could be investing in stocks. That could be private lending. That could be crypto. Those are, I, I'm not a big stock investor. I like the private investments. But the principles that I've learned and I show people can be applied across the board. And I want to tell you about one other decision point in my life. So in my last job that I had, I was actually working for one of our clients. And uh, and uh, you and I talked about SAP. They were doing an SAP implementation and I was seconded over to them to help because they needed more people. And so this, this was a large oil and gas company. And our company, everybody wanted to go work for them because they were supposed to have this amazing benefits program and all this. So one day they sent out this email to everyone about they were doing this benefits meeting. And I thought, I'm going to go and find out about this benefits program, even though I didn't work for them because, you know, maybe they would scoop me up at some point. Right. So I go to this meeting and they're talking about all this. And long story short, this older gentleman at the back of the room stood up and lost his marbles, Billy, because he was about six months away from retirement. And for 30 years, he had dedicated himself to this company, believing that he was going to be taken care of. And he had just found out that, nope, that wasn't going to be the case. He was not going to be getting enough money in retirement from his pension to support his lifestyle and his family's lifestyle. And he was not going to be able to stop working in his 60s. And in that auditorium, in that chair, I made a decision that I wasn't going to depend on any government, any company, any anything other than me to to manage my finances, manage my wealth, and make sure that I, I made my dreams come true. Man, so the, the whole point of being able to realize dreams and not depend on someone else or some other entity is, I believe right now from a different, having this perspective, and I, I tend to share it with you, is it usually takes something that is non financial to have people make that realization, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious because of course you're working with a lot more people. Like we here today, we have a lot of people that are watching or listening to us and they they are a lot of software sales executives. And we have a lot of people who are doctors and lawyers. We have people that are um, in professional sports leagues, right? That they are listening, they're watching. The story you just said was, was pretty impactful to me, right? Because I'm, I'm, I hear this all the time, right? Because I talk to people all the time. But what do you think, or, or why do you think it is that it takes something that is a non-financial impact on someone's lives to make the make someone realize the importance of being in control of your financial strategy? So, um, this is a great question, Billy. I love this. I love this sort of you know get to the the root of sort of sort of things questions. So I'm, I'm trained in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. You heard of that? Okay. Oh, yeah. So we really right. dive into the subconscious mind and what makes people tick. And I just love that stuff. Like, like that's what I would do if I wasn't in what I am. I would, I would be like a brain researcher or something like that. Mm. So in, in NLP, they'll tell you there's two motivators. There's away from motivation and there's towards motivation. Okay. Mm. And, and real quick definition, away from means that that's people who are trying to avoid pain. That's what motivates them is about avoiding pain. But then there's another subset of the population that they're motivated by achieving goals and making things happen. 
but that is a way smaller percentage of the population. It's about 80, 20. Okay. Now I am a towards person. I, I have been my entire life. It's not better or worse. It's yeah. just, you know, the way you were brought up, whatever, but the vast majority of the population are away from that's what motivates them. So it has to be their doctor telling them, if you don't stop eating this much sugar, you're going to have a heart attack in the next six months, or you've got six months to live, or you're about to lose your house or whatever. And, and all you got to do is pay attention to the ads on TV or the ads in the subway. If you, uh, if you ever ride the subway, they're all negative. Afraid of going bankrupt, stressed, tired, whatever, right? Everything is negative because they know the vast majority of the population are motivated by that away from. So mm. that's why I believe it takes some major negative thing to really shake people up and scare the, the, the crap out of them where they want to make a substantial change. Now, I think for a lot of people, that was the pandemic, right? And, and I say as much as the pandemic was a health pandemic, the financial pandemic that was going on at the same time was a thousand times as worse, right? I know a few people that got COVID, they didn't feel good for a couple of weeks and, and then they got over it. Thankfully, I didn't know anybody who, who passed away or got really sick. But the people who have been under financial stress for the last two years, the people that were freaking out on the phone for three days, trying to reach their bank or their government to see if they were going to be able to make their mortgage payments, that is across the board. Like that is millions upon millions of people around the world that were suffering uh, from that. So ironically, everybody's been focused on the health pandemic side of it, and that's causing changes. But it was, the, it was the financial aspect of it that I believe affected more people, right? But people don't make that, the, the change from that. They, they slide back into their old habits and their old ways of doing things. Well, that, you just kind of, that was one of the things I was going to ask. So given that the, the health portion is, well, depending on where you are in the world and when you're listening to this, is, it seems to be getting better, right? Um, there are, we're creatures of, of habit, right? And so as things start to become the way they were, then we tend to go back to doing the things that we did before. Uh, before we start talking about a lot of the things that we, I really want to chat with you about on, on the coaching piece, I guess I am, I, it's, just, it's always, I'm curious because I, I come from a family where I had no exposure to real estate, zero. Me neither. Um, I, I didn't even know the difference between uh, investing and saving when I grew up. And it always amazes me. I'm always curious, like, what is it that attracts people who didn't have any, like, link to real estate, to real estate. Could you, and I know you kind of, you talked about you, that, that's what you did, but what was the motivator for you to actually move to real estate, to, to even try to test real Another estate? Another great question. I love these, Billy. Honestly, I've been on a lot of podcasts and nobody has asked me these particular questions. You, uh, you, you may have done this once before, right? <laughs> eh, maybe once or twice. <laughs> so honestly, I'm the same as you. When I was growing up, like I come from like farm stock, we're extremely conservative, right? I remember going to my dad and saying like, hey, we should get into investments. He got up and left the room and didn't talk to me for a week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was extremely conservative, didn't believe in debt, all that sort of stuff. And I get it. He, he was born, you know, uh, around the time of the Depression and saw the Second World War and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, that just that wasn't part of their DNA. But what they did give me was an absolute drive for freedom and independence. Right. I, I credit my parents for that. They were fantastic for that. And they really taught me to stand on my own two feet and, and, and be want to be free. Right. In, in all sorts of different emotional, physical, uh, spiritual, all that kind of stuff. And as I said, when I was in that corporate world, what what I was really reacting to was the lack of freedom. Right. I remember it's like it, it could be three thirty in the afternoon and you could be done all your work. But if your boss saw you leaving early, it, you know, that that was like some kind of crime, even if they, you, they didn't you didn't have any more work to do. And I was like, this is ridiculous. If I've managed to be more efficient and I've got my work done and there's nothing else for me to do. You'd rather I just sat and surfed on the computer for half an hour. So I stay here until my four o'clock deadline or whatever. So I was really responding to a lack of freedom. And as I said, I started searching all sorts of different things. I, I was flying around the country, meeting with people. I just was like, how do I get out of the matrix? I didn't have that language back yeah. then, but you know, that's what I was trying to do. And then the guy beside me is like, I'm working on it. This is what I'm doing. I could have cared less about real estate. You could have asked me the day before him and I started talking, hey, what's your mortgage rate? I would have been like, my what? Like, I, I did not have a background in this stuff. 
But then he started introducing me to this. Now I am pretty good with math and numbers and that sort of thing. So I was initially attracted to that. But when he started to show and demonstrate to me what was possible and that the returns I could make would be 5, 10, 20, 30 times what you know the banks were offering, that's what appealed to me. And that I could be in control. Because one of the things I love about real estate is I can buy a piece of property and I can change it. I could add a basement suite. I could do renos. I could, I could improve the landscaping, right? So it was an investment that was in my control. There was multiple ways to make returns on that. And I didn't have to be as dependent on my government or my bank or that sort of stuff. So that's where it really appealed to me. And then I found out that I actually kind of love it, like the tangible aspect of real estate. You can feel it. You can touch it. You can see it. You can walk through it. I love the fact that, you know, a lot of my properties have have offered affordable housing to people who would not have been able to, right? When I first got into real estate, the city I was living in, the vacancy rate was, was ridiculously low. They said, you can move here without a job. Don't move here without a place to live. So we were providing good, beautiful, bright basement suites for people that you know may have to have been doubling up on the couch with somebody. So we were actually doing something positive at the same time. And I believe investment should be like that. It should be a win-win-win for everybody involved, not predatory type stuff. So that all of those factors attracted me to it. Now, I've moved into other types of investing since, but I still stick with those principles. And then I show other people that it doesn't have to be the, you know, the, the, the Donald Trump or the, the, the whatever, the predatory style of investing where they're kicking people out. and all. It doesn't have to be like that. You can partner with those people. My first partner told me, our tenant is our investment partner. They might not know it, but they are our investment partner. Let's treat them like a partner. And we would have people that would stay in our buildings for years because they loved how we treated them with respect. Yeah, it's one of those things where as soon as you don't have a paying client, you realize the importance of providing a an appropriate service, a great service for the residents or tenants that Absolutely. are living in your in your in your uh, in your asset, right? And a lot of people, again, when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden people were leaving the downtown cores of the city, then everybody found out how important their tenants were, right? Yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. Really hope you're enjoying today's conversation. And once again, if you're an accredited investor and you are tired of getting crushed by your W-2 taxes and you're looking for a new way to gain more control over your freedom to choose, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest. Once again, that's firstgencp.com forward slash invest. Now let's get back to today's conversation. So when you think about the just the the things that you saw, the influence from your parents that that desire for for freedom, being able to have more control over an asset that was producing uh, not just a an economic return, but that economic return then provided you also with the ability to gain more of the freedom and the control. So that that's really helpful. And as you're in this asset class, there's also this whole idea of you, you started helping with instruction, you were gaining experience, you were doing things, but then also I think, I think even early on in your career, like you were in Canada and you were helping people that were investing and in, even investing yourself outside of the, outside of Canada. So yep. maybe you could talk to a little bit about that because that is just lovely music to my ears because here at the Going Long Podcast, of course, we believe in helping people to feel comfortable and confident investing beyond your backyard. But maybe you can talk to us a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, when my partner and I started doing this, and my, my investment partner and I started doing this in Calgary, one of the things that happened, which was kind of funny, was we were partnering with people who wanted to be investing in real estate, but really didn't know how to get started. So, so we became the working partner and they became the, the capital partner. Mm-hmm. But what often would happen is we would come to them and we would say, okay, we found a property, we're ready to pull the trigger. And they're like, well, can I see it? And we'd be like, why? <laughs> why do you need to see it? They'd be like, um, we're like, we've established investment criteria, you know, us and our realtor have gone through it. We know this is going to be a cash flowing property. What, what do you need to see? And they're kind of like, yeah, I guess I don't really need to see it, do I? And so as, as him and I developed our criteria more and we, you know, our, our uh, partners that we were working with realtors and brokers and all that, we started to realize, well, wait a minute, we don't even necessarily need to see the property. As long as there's someone that we trust and we can verify the details of this investment, we could be buying things outside of our city, outside of our province, outside of our country, whatever. And and it makes sense because at the end of the day, investments, you know, if you're not living in it, 
what difference does it make whether the walls are, are painted purple or, or what have you, right? Now, it, obviously, you still got to attract tenants and, yeah. and all the rest of that. But the point being that the investment itself is what needs to be evaluated. And as long as there's a way to evaluate that, I could be buying a property in the Czech Republic. It, it, you know, a property is a property is a property. It doesn't matter. As long as I've got access to the data, which in today with the internet is so easy, and I can find out about that area and what kind of rent am I going to get and, you know, that sort of thing. You know, I still believe it's important with property to have somebody physically go and have a look. Because I do remember my partner and I were going to buy something up in Edmonton, which is about three hours north of where we were. And he went to visit it. And he's like, oh, yeah, the building's great, but you got to step over the prostitutes and the homeless people to get into the, uh, the, the building. So I don't think we want to invest here. So as long as you've got somebody who can sort of take a look or a realtor who's telling you, no, no, stay away from that area, you know, somebody who's an expert in that. Absolutely. But that's where team members start to come in more importantly. And I believe investing is a team sport, not an individual sport. Yeah, right? we, abs yeah we absolutely say here, hashtag teamwork makes the dream work. And exactly. what I like, what I really like about what you're saying, Brian, is it, it aligns very much with the, with the philosophy that I like to talk about and, and teach here, which is first and foremost, be very crystal clear on what it is that the, the personal benefit that you're looking for, not just, not, not just what it is, but also why you want it. Because as Absolutely. you know, it's not if something's going to get hard, it's when it gets hard. Mm -hmm. You need to definitely make sure that those difficult moments that you have a clear reason why you're doing what you're doing. From there, we go to the location that's going to give you the highest probability of being able to find that benefit from there. And I absolutely agree with you, Brian, and teach the same, which is making sure that you build the team, make sure that your team understands the location, because especially as a long distance investor, there's a probably less than 5% chance you're going to be nearby the asset that you're purchasing. So the team has to understand the asset, they have to understand the location, and they need to understand what it is that you want and why you want it. And then afterwards, whether you're buying large pieces of energy equipment, you're buying a single family residence, you're making a short term rental, as long as those four things are in line with one another, you're going to give yourself the highest probability of success, which is ultimately what you're helping to teach people um, to do. And speaking, with, uh, speaking of which, we've got a lot of high paid professionals here. They're listening. Some people are just here for like the first or second conversation, maybe. So congratulations for being here and listening to Brian. Um, but sometimes when we're really busy and we like a lot of control and we're having lots of success in our success, excuse me, in our roles at the day job. Um, our business as owners and stuff like that, there's this whole concept of giving up control to other people and actually letting them potentially create returns or help me get to the goal. What do you say to those people that are, they, they feel it in their gut, like they got to, they could be doing something other, something else, but they're still really wanting to maintain a lot of control. What do you say to that person? They're torn. So, it's, it's an interesting one in that because let me, let me make a, a, a distinction here. Please. So we've used the word control, and I, I do like investments where I do have some control. But what it really boils down to is at the end of the day, my results are my responsibility. And that's the way I approach it. So I don't like what I see with the banks where they're like, just go on our website, answer three simple questions, and we'll take care of the rest. Right. Like this is just baloney. Those guys have their best interests in mind, not yours. And the example I always give is, would you go hand over your new baby to a daycare and be like, OK, we'll see you in 18 years. Hopefully you've raised a good kid for us. Right? I, say, I, say, I say something like that. Exactly. Right. Exactly the same. Yeah, like yeah. That seems ridiculous, but that's what people are doing with their investments, right? They're handing yep. over their 401k, their RRSPs, whatever that you call it in Europe. And then mm -hmm. they're going, OK, bye. We'll see you in 25 years. Right. So I still believe, you know, whether it be my health, my fitness, my, my work, my investments, ultimately, I am still responsible for that. But like we just said, there's teamwork involved. I don't have to be doing everything. And, you know, there's a reason I call my, my company next level success. There's always a next level to go to. And, and one of those, you know, it, it was a next level for me to start investing in places that I didn't live. That was a next level move for me, right? I started in the city that I lived in, but then, then it was like, hey, wait a minute. I can be involved in investments that are in Central America, that are in the US, that are in other places in Canada. And I now am. So that was the next level. In order to do that, though, I also had to learn how to delegate and how to trust and how to evaluate those team members and make sure that we were on the same page. 
I never abdicate my responsibility. It's not like, oh, well, now they're in charge and I'm not going to pay attention to that. And right, we hear about all these celebrities and movie stars and actors that get all their money taken because they let go of that responsibility. So it's not that. But sure, you might have to give up some control. I trust my management company, right? When they send me a tenant, I still check through all the stuff, but I trust them and I have to trust and believe that they're going to put that person in. They're going to collect that damage deposit. They're going to do those types of things like that. If they don't, then I fire them and I get a different management company. Okay. But yeah. And you said, and I love this. My first exercise that I ever do with anyone is what is your one, five and 10 year goals? I want to understand where do you want to be? What do you want to be eating? Where do you want to be living? What do you want to smell when you wake up in the morning? What, what are all these things? Because you're right. When the poop hits the fan, I got to understand and you got to understand why am I doing this? And going back to your question earlier, right? Why don't people make that switch? Why does something life altering have to happen? It's because they're not clear on their goals. They don't know where they're trying to get to, right? The difference between a gold medal and me and you is those people are absolutely clear. They have envisioned standing on that podium, hearing their national anthem, a gazillion times yep. and everything they do on a daily basis is driven to them achieving that goal, right? You don't have to be that driven, but there's a happy medium in there where I understand where I'm trying to get to. And now all my decisions are, am I getting closer to my goal or is it taking me further away? Well, you know what this is? So we, we've got to hurry up. We got to do the going along final three. Cause I know people are like, Brian, I got to get in touch with you. I want to find out how, to, how we can talk more stuff. Like, so listen, we got to get to the going along final three. Cause if not, right. no one's going to know, no one's going to know. So um, I appreciate that, um, Brian. And so I told you, we're going to, you're going to get five questions. You got two in the beginning and now it's time for the going along final three. And I like to bring things while well, you're over there in, in Canada. And I like to bring things over this way to this side of the pond. Cause this is now my new, uh, new side of the, the world, my adopted hometown here in Barcelona, Spain. So I would love for you to share with the going along family. What is your favorite European city that you've either visited or still on your bucket list to visit? So I'm going to do one that's still on my bucket list and it would be uh, Brussels, Belgium. Ooh. And the reason I picked that is because uh, my grandparents on my dad's side both came from Belgium and around that area. And I haven't been there yet. I, I've been to France. I, I spent a day in Germany. Uh, I've been to England, uh, but haven't been to Belgium yet. But I've yep. seen it in movies and, and, you know, shows and all that sort of stuff. And it just looks absolutely beautiful and gorgeous. Whenever the Tour de France goes through Belgium, I always make sure I'm glued to, to it when I watch that. So that's on my bucket list is, is I know one day soon, I'm going to go there and, and sort of get back to my roots of where I come from and, and you know, what what place in Europe uh, my ancestors came from. All right. Love that. So Brussels, I'll, I'll have to tell you off, off camera or off voice. I don't know how you say that, but of a New Year's Eve celebration ah, in Brussels. So but anyway, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not for recording. It's not for recording. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So, so appreciate that Brussels, Belgium. So we'll include that in the show notes. And then this, the other thing is I, I consider myself super fortunate because I get to see a lot of really successful people. I get to talk to a lot of really successful people. I consider you to be someone who's very successful, Brian. And, and one of the things that I've noticed, and hopefully you agree, is that people that are that are very successful, like one of the main reasons that they continue to be successful is they, unlike most people, they devise a plan, they draw out the plan, and then when they start the plan, they get every single thing on the plan right the first time, and then from there, it allows them to... Did I do that? Um, it's just a joke, Brian. Don't worry. It's just a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> Brian's like, oh my God, did he just do that? It's a joke. It's an inside joke. It's don't worry. Don't worry. Everybody check out the video version because it's really, really good. Like Brian was really suffering for me. He was like, oh my gosh. Anyway. Uh, I was afraid for you. I was like, oh my God. Is, is he pain? Is everything all right? Right. What's, he, what's he doing? What's he doing? No, listen, there, I mean, the reality is, and you've seen a lot of successful people and yes, you are a successful person. And the reality is those people that are successful, not only do they make mistakes, they usually make 20 to 50 times more mistakes than most people. But this is no joke, Brian. They do do one thing very, very differently. And every single time they do it differently. It's whenever these mistakes or learning opportunities or however you want to call them happen, every single time that they're relevant, they stop, they learn from that mistake, and then they go and they put different strategies, tactics, and actions in place to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening again. Absolutely. 
So what I would love for you to share with us, not the, not the mistake, not the, not the learning opportunity, but really what's the one lesson that you know that the Going Long family needs to hear today to minimize the probability of that exact same thing happening? So, you know, for me, the, the, the thing that, that has happened to me is when I have gone ahead and made an assumption, that could be an assumption about a person, like, like let's say you and I have a good relationship. And then you introduce me to somebody else and I automatically go, oh, well, that's a friend of Billy's. So they must be a good person and they must have my best interests at heart. And I don't do my due diligence around it. I, I'm a real due diligence guy when it comes to investments, like all the work up front. I like to say most people will spend more time invest, uh, uh, researching their next big screen TV than they will their next $100,000 investment. Like it blows my mind with that, right? No. But I am a real due diligence guy. And so that's where I've made mistakes is when I haven't done that extra little bit of due diligence, because maybe I didn't want to offend someone, or maybe it was, you know, I was busy or, or what have you. And that's what's always led to, to my mistakes or somebody else letting me down. And so now I'm like, you know what, this is my money. It's my responsibility. I'm going to ask the tough questions. I'm going to dig in. I'm, I'm going to find out the data that I need to find out. And if somebody gets offended by that or, or whatever, as Dr. Seuss says, those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind, right? So it, it's turned out to be a good litmus test because if people do get offended when I ask the tough questions, yeah. then I know the investment is, is not for me. And, and uh, a real quick story, I had a prospect call me about a year ago. She was looking to do one of my coaching programs and she was about to wire $100,000 to this private investment company. I said, send me the details. I looked through, I gave her a couple of questions to ask them. And I said, tell me what the answers are. She came back. She said, I said, look, I'm, I'm never going to tell people what to do or what not to do, but I would not make this investment based on the information that you just shared me from those two questions that I just had you ask. Mm. A year later, it came out in the media that this investment company went bankrupt, tens of millions of dollars of Canadians gone. And, and didn't she message me going, oh my God, Brian, mm. am I ever glad I had that conversation and you gave me those two tough questions to ask. Mm. So yeah. that's where, you know, that's what I learned early in my investing career and have applied in what I'm teaching other people. Ask the question. Love it's it. not a big screen TV with Costco where you can go and return it. It's usually buyer beware with investments and you're going to be the one on the hook. Yeah, absolutely love that. So uh, make sure you're asking the questions, especially those ones that make you feel uncomfortable because those are the ones that are typically going to save you from the sleepless nights. And a lot so, of people don't even know what the questions are. And that's where I help with, with my coaching and all that sort of stuff. Let me show you from my experience, here's the questions you should be asking. Here's the process that I follow with every investment that I look at and the data that I gather on that before I sign on the dotted line and hand over my check. Phenomenal. So appreciate that. And then lastly, and this is the last question, Brian. Love to fill people's brains, the going along family with knowledge. And so what is the one book that you would recommend to us today? So I mentioned uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and probably everybody or almost everybody on this call has read that. But a lot of people don't know that there was a whole series of books by Robert Kiyosaki. And the second one that I read after Rich Dad, Poor Dad was called Cash Flow Quadrant. And that was the absolute game changer for me. I still go back to that one and reference it all the time. And it talks about moving from the employee or the sole proprietor model into the investor slash business owner model. I, I remember sitting on an airplane and reading that book and, and I get goosebumps just talking about it and just being like, all these people on the plane would be happy being my employee and helping me become wealthy because they don't want to mm -hmm. trade risk uh, or, or freedom for security, right? Mm -hmm. Like that book was absolutely mind bending for me cash flow quadrant by uh, by robert kiyosaki love awesome. love love that book yeah it's definitely a game changer we will include that in the show notes and i'm just going back and i'm thinking like from the very beginning like we had a chance to meet mr anderson right because you were feeling like you were in the matrix you were that guy and you were you know you were satisfied you trapped. were going through things and you were trapped and you know it was just kind of like hey this is the next day today and um then you finally got well, there was that person that was sitting next to you <laughs> that kind of changed things for you. Not only the fact that they were sitting there next to you, but that you also were curious enough to ask and find out what was what they were doing. And they were also gracious enough to share more about their plan. And you continued to do that. And you, well, also decided, hey, listen, I'm not going to wait for somebody else to build my retirement. You're going to do that on your own. And then 
by being able to also have the impetus not just to invest where you were, but also invest beyond your backyard, which is music to our ears here at the Going Long <laughs> Podcast, you've continued to help other people recognize through your, through working with you as a coach, through your practical experience, being able to put those into to different models and help people through real, real world experience, people that are doctors, lawyers, dentists, um, sales executives. And I know that through the things you've been sharing with us, people are like, oh my gosh, Billy, just get to the point, man. Just ask him, just ask him. So, okay, I'm going to ask you, Brian, what is the best way for the Going Long family to find out more about you, uh, learn what you're doing and uh, understand more about your coaching program? So probably the easiest is, you know, go on the website and there's ways to send me messages there or, or just drop me an email. Um, you know, the, the name of the company is Next Level Success, N as in next. So my website is nlscoaching.com. Really easy. My email is Brian B and Brian is with an I. So Brian B at nlscoaching.com. That's probably the easiest. I always respond. It's, it's me responding to the emails. You, you look up on the website and send a message through that. My assistant will share that with me. So I see what, what people write in. Cause I, you know, I want to know about people's story. I want to understand what's going on with them. And if it's a, if it's a good fit for us to be, uh, to be working together. I, I always have programs going. I'm doing one right now about how to invest in pre-con condos. I'm about halfway through. So the next program will probably start up in, in like July kind of thing. Uh, and I'm always available for one-on-one -on -one coaching if that's a better fit for people as well. But yeah, Brian B at nlscoaching.com. And I, I can't wait to hear from some of these folks. And, and you know, uh, uh, maybe you and I talk again. I, I don't think we could run out of things to talk about. I, 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 yeah, we could Brian, chat for a while. I, I, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, I, I know we could chat for, for quite a while. So about three more uh, hours, right? At least at a minimum, at a minimum. So everybody, Brian B at nlscoaching.com. We're going to include that in the show notes. So don't worry if you're running on the treadmill or you're cooking dinner, don't worry. We'll make it really, really easy for you. All you're going to have to do is click a link and you can get in touch with Brian, find out more about him, go to his website uh, and things like that. So Brian, listen, I just, I would like to thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, man. Thank you for investing your time with me and the entire Going Long family. Uh, thank you. Can't, uh, can't thank you enough. Thank you, Billy. This, I, I love stuff like this. I love being able to share and, and empower and educate people. And, and, you know, I wish we had things like this when I got it started in, in investing. They didn't have podcasts and all that no. back then. You, so yeah. I, I love these kinds of things. Love what you're doing. Love. And I, I love that you're in Europe talking to audiences around the world. That is super fantastic. So thank you for having me on today. Awesome. Thanks so much. And if you give me like 10, 15 seconds, just the last couple words, the going along family. Listen, everybody, Brian left it here. He's giving you real life experience. He shared it with you. He's talked to you about it. He's been in the matrix himself. He broke out. Uh, he has a coaching program that can help you. He's given it, made it really easy for you to get in touch with him. Also, take today's conversation, share it with your friends, take some time, talk about the content that you've heard about today, and that's going to help you to become an even more informed investor. Brian's made it really easy. If you want to reach out, reach out to him. Um, you know what? And while you're doing all that, I'll be right here preparing for the next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Once again, today's conversation was sponsored by First Generation Capital Partners. If you want to find out more, go to firstgencp.com forward slash invest.